And I'll remind you all to type your name in chat for my attendance records. Um, up to 35 here. So um, let me start sharing screen here. Park this over here. So we've been talking about the terrain editor, um, the thing that lets us build a platform on which we can make our games. And we went through various of the different uh, tools, uh, defining the scale. Uh, uh, we have this paint tool that lets us do things like raise and lower terrain. Uh, uh, the brush has us, uh, we pick among many different brushes. Uh, we have the size of the brush and its opacity, how strong its effect is. Uh, left raises, shift left lowers it and we can paint some terrain. Uh, uh, we had the set height tool that uh, we can use, we can paint and it'll paint towards a particular height or we can just flatten all. And we had a smoothing tool that, that smooths out bumps. Uh, <clears throat> we painted texture uh, uh, using, using one of the grass textures, uh, these special textures that are designed to wrap uh, 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 again with an opacity uh, that allows you to kind of blend different textures together. Um, uh, we put a character in so that we can play with it. Uh, we played with the tree tool. Uh, again, we can paint trees onto the landscape. Uh, or we can do a mass placing that just places a lot of them out there. And then we looked at the detail tool uh, for painting uh, the, the uh, billboard grass textures. Um, I, I did warn you with grass that it, it uh, can very quickly overwhelm your scene. You have to be kind of close up to paint grasses if you do it from far away. A, you can't see it until you get close to it. And so you can overwhelm your scene and you end up with fields and fields of grass that uh, is very laggy. Uh, you can also paint mesh objects. Um, uh, in this case, you want to set the healthy and dry colors both to white and use the lit vertex. And while this is a, an okay way to paint boulders and other features around your mesh, uh, unfortunately, they don't have colliders, so they're not terribly useful. I will warn you again against uh, using this kind of texture to paint your terrain. Uh, uh, you'll get it, it'll work, but it'll look kind of weird. Uh, we want this kind of texture, one that uh, is seamless in the sense that this edge exactly matches this edge and this edge exactly matches this edge. Um, and the, the last one was the, uh, the general settings, which we already used to set the size of our terrain, length, width, and height. Uh, there are a lot of other settings in here that have to do with uh, uh, the uh, some of the optimization features. Uh, generally, the default settings are fine, uh, but you can adjust them and uh, make some improvements. Um, so last time I clobbered my world by loading that uh, set of, of um, uh, assets. And I've fixed that so that it doesn't clobber it. And I now have here uh, a nice scene that I've fixed up so that it works okay. And one of the things I wanna show you here, um, wait, let me get in full screen here. If you, change that toggle and then pause and unpause it, it changes size. So I've got some of the speed trees here. These are speed trees. 
and I've got some speed trees over here. And these are full three-dimensional models of trees that are really quite nice. And the speed tree is actually a commercial tool. But I did also show you some of the, um, some of the other trees, uh, some of the old fashioned trees. Where are they? I'm lost. Some of the old fashioned trees. Um, you have a question in the chat about uh, why are no assets showing up in the My Asset tab, even though he's downloaded several from the Asset Store? Um, it probably has to do with um, you. You may not be signed in for. Uh, you have to be signed into the same Unity account on both the editor and in the asset store. And I run into this all the time because I have two Unity IDs and I purchase something with one ID and then my editor is with a different one. So you, if he's somehow gotten two IDs or, um, uh, but I, I'm, not, I'm not sure what the problem is. Um, I'll, I'll talk to him after class would we'll try and fix it. Okay. And I, as I, I remind you, I can't see chat while I have full screen going. So instead of asking me questions in chat, just go ahead and audio interrupt me. That's fine. He said he didn't have a mic. Oh, okay. Well, thank you for helping him out. Uh, what's his name? I'll talk to him. Tell him I'll well, I'll talk to them after class. So the thing I want to show you with these old fashioned trees, when you're close to them, uh, they're full three dimensional trees, but the ones that are far away are billboards. And this is a feature that's designed to lower the lag. And as I move closer to it, you see these trees turn into uh, uh, 3D trees, as I move away, they turn back into billboards. And this is a setting in the, in the uh, terrain cogs. This is the uh, billboard start and fade length. So the trees at, at a distance of 50 meters uh, turn from billboards into three-dimensional trees, and they do it gradually over a fade length. And there's some other settings that you can apply here that deal with the trees and detail objects, uh, how far away you can see them, uh, what their detail density is, and uh, the maximum number of mesh trees that are visible in your scene. So, um, so be aware of this when you're using old fashioned trees, some of which come in with the uh, uh, with the the older asset packages that are available for free uh, and and particular some of the ones that I've provided for you. The speed trees of which we have three examples a broadleaf, a conifer and a palm are uh, are different. They're much more modern trees. And in addition, the broad the uh, I, I don't think the old fashioned ones have colliders either, which means you can kind of walk right through a tree. So uh, uh, the next feature of our world I want to mention here is the skybox. And we've seen the skybox in our various scenes. We have this, when you open a new scene, you get this uh, nice blue sky. Uh, and the skybox is, uh, added in the lighting setting. So from window uh, rendering lighting settings, this opens this lighting window, which I, uh, uh, we will use a lot. And there are various things in here uh, that, uh, that, that we'll, we'll use. Uh, one of the things I uh, want to remind you is to turn off real-time lighting and mixed lighting and turn off auto generate and generate your lighting manually. Otherwise, Unity continually updates lighting uh, as you manipulate your scene and it does it in the background using some extra threads 
and it can really flog your computer if you're not careful, particularly if you're working in a big scene with a lot of detail. So in the lighting window, turn off real and mixed and auto generate and generate the lighting manually. Um, now the skybox. Yes, what? Uh, how do you get that lighting window open next to the project tab? So uh, put from the window pull down here under rendering, pick, pick lighting settings, and that will open it. And then you can dock it like any other window where you want it. And this is, this is saved in my, uh, my kind of default editor layout. So it's always there. Another handy one is the light explorer, which shows you all the lights in the scene and their very different properties. We'll talk a lot more about this when we get to lighting. Okay. So uh, the skybox material is set here in the in in this lighting menu, and the default skybox is this special kind of. Uh, 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 Skybox that is actually a procedural uh, computation of an atmosphere. And so um, here, and, and these are made, I made a couple of them here in my skyboxes. This is a, a skybox asset that's available on the uh, Google Drive, my Google Drive. But here's here's the uh, default skybox, which you can make by making a material and then picking for its shader skybox, skybox procedural. And that will make one of these skybox shaders. Now I've, I've, uh, this one is the default settings here. This is this is what a standard default skybox looks like. It has a particular sun size. It has a sun size convergence, which is kind of how focused the sun is. And in particular, it has atmospheric thickness and the tint of the sky and the ground and an exposure setting. And here's one where I've cranked everything up into kind of a weird space. Uh, I've got a, a giant sun with no convergence, a uh, very thick atmosphere, and a green sky with a yellow ground uh, and an exposure. And so this now, in my world, I've got this set up so that I can um, switch among different scenes here. Oops. At least I thought I did. Went wrong. Oh, uh, so this is the the default skybox, and I, I have this set up with keys that I can switch among different scenes. Um, unfortunately, the there. Okay, so we're in the 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 default skybox scene. And if I move back one scene, where'd it go? Okay, sorry. So now with other keys, I can switch the skybox. So here's that. Here's that weird sky that that I just created, and this is this is the standard one. Now the thing I want you to look at here is the subtle shading of the ground that changes as I change the skybox. Um, let let me turn off this the light. So this is now just what we call ambient lighting, and I'll do much more about lighting when we get to lighting. But the difference 
between this blue sky where the ambient lighting down here is kind of blue and this, whoops. And this weird one, now the ground is kind of red. And this is the ambient light. It's light that is moving in all directions everywhere uniformly in the scene. We also have the overhead skylight that is making the shadows and adding to that. But, uh, but as we move among uh, the different sky boxes that I've got here, uh, I have uh, the default one and in my, in my skybox assets here are a whole bunch of different skyboxes uh, that are made up of six different textures, forward, backward, up, down, right, and left. And these are then projected onto the infinite world surrounding uh, our character. And so these, sky boxes look like this and we can't there we don't whoops sorry we don't see the scenes or anything there but there are you can kind of feel it a little bit over here you can kind of feel the size of the box but these are these are uh, six-sided sky boxes there are other kinds too panoramas and and some others that use kind of a fish eye but here are a whole bunch of different sky boxes. Uh, and I'm using the K and the L key to move among them. And the thing to notice is that the ambient light with the overhead light turned off is completely different lighting. And this does this in real time. And uh, uh, this is a nice feature of uh, the Unity lighting model that we'll talk about a lot more. Uh, I have a point light down in the little lake there that uh, that is uh, uh, illuminating the water underneath. Now, uh, this brings me to my next topic, which is water. And in the standard assets that uh, that I loaded from Unity 217 or from the asset store, uh, we have these various waters. And under uh, the standard water, there's pro daytime and pro nighttime. There's not a real lot of difference between these two. Uh, the nighttime light is a little darker. And each of these have a number of different settings. Um, the water, uh, this is this is daytime reflective water, and you can see that we can see reflections of those trees in the distance. Uh, I've made the water very big so that it extends out to the horizon. Uh, the water here is kind of a big circle. It's a big circle that I've made quite big so that it extends out to the horizon. Uh, by kind of carefully adjusting the edges of my rectangular terrain, uh, I've got it on, under the water so that I have a nice island-like effect with my terrain here. Uh, another setting for the water is uh, refractive and this lets you see through the water into the into the water underneath and it is kind of it's it's a little ripply and distorted so that things that are underneath the water uh, uh, are rippling uh, the water is a dynamic object that is is uh, changing with time uh, and giving the effect of ripples and there are settings for the water that let you fiddle with uh, how big the waves are and how fast they're moving and other things. One problem I noticed with this uh, refractive water is that out here, 
at the edge of my world, since I can see down through the water, I can see the edge of my, my terrain. And here's a case where we might use the tool for the terrain, this tool that lets us make terrain, create neighboring terrain. And with create neighboring terrain, we have two choices. Uh, we can fill in its height map using the neighbor. This would make the created surrounding terrains edges match up with the central terrain. And we have a choice of either clamping or mirroring. Clamping will just match the edge to your central terrain, whereas mirroring will kind of make a diminishing copy of the bumps in your terrain out into the world. Uh, and I've done this in this next scene here. In this next scene, whoops. Where I've surrounded my terrain with a whole bunch of, of uh, these mirror terrains, no clamped ter terrains. And so now I don't have that artifact of looking down into the water and seeing uh, uh, the edge of my terrain. And if I look at this in the in the editor, uh, now here's my little central terrain that I'm walking around on, and I've got all these uh, uh, other terrains uh, surrounding it, and they're all they're all each one is a little. Uh, terrain uh, and uh, uh, and you can continue to make more of them and it doesn't seem terribly laggy so uh, I, this doesn't doesn't seem to impact things very much so uh, those are the um, those are the daytime water uh, nighttime water the reflective is just a little bit darker uh, I, I, with refraction, I can barely see any difference between it. Uh, it, it. It looks very similar, I guess, because we're seeing through the water. I think the only difference between daytime and nighttime is the uh, 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 albedo color for the basic water is a little darker. And of course, these are all things you can get in and customize yourself. There's one other kind of water, the water four. Um, water four is kind of laggy. But uh, it is pretty cool in that it actually has a moving surface. So the water here is kind of sloshing around in my little puddle. Uh, it, it has uh, uh, both, you can, it, it is refractive. You can see down through it uh, and it is reflective. It also reflects things uh, in your world. Uh, because you can see down through it, it has that same problem with uh, being able to see the edge. And so uh, here's water four where I've made it big enough so that I can, it, it, it covers to the horizon. And now you can kind of see the waves lapping along this beach that I've created around my little island. So let me pause here. Uh, listen to the skybox. Uh, it's a physics-based computation of atmospheric scattering. It's actually a model. Um, one other thing I didn't mention about the skybox: if you if you set your uh, your your uh, directional light up to rotate, you can have a day-night cycle. I'll show you that later. Um, the uh, water objects. Uh, uh, they're circular objects. Uh, you can adjust their position, elevation, and size. X and Z make it into an ellipse. Uh, they have reflective and refractive options. Uh, and there's also a basic water that, that uh, uh, um, is essentially water pro daytime and nighttime with the simple setting set. Uh, and there's this water four. Now, let me 
entertain questions here. If there are any questions, I'll look in chat and see if anything. Uh, guys are talking. Uh, any questions? No questions? Okay, back to sharing screen. And I'm gonna close this one. Incidentally, I, I post all of these on, on the Google Drive along with the posted notes. So uh, these will all be available as well. Now, one of the other features of the terrain in the settings here is um, the ability to export the height map. Now, uh, it exports in kind of an awkward format uh, called RAW. And right now, I don't have any devices that can read RAW files. Uh, my Photoshop Elements used to be able to read it, but it doesn't anymore. And GIMP doesn't seem to read it either, so I don't know what to do. So exporting one of these topographies uh, doesn't seem to be an option. However, the import still works. And when you, uh, um, I've generated a bunch of RAWs here, um, which I've put in the, where are we? I've put in the height map folder that I will post. I've put a bunch of these in here. And so here's an example of one that I made in, uh, I believe in GIMP and I painted on it. And the uh, imported raws have to be a grayscale. Uh, they have to be uh, eight bits. I, this is in the notes. Um, but if I import one of these, so let me import that empty raw. And these incidentally have to be powers of two plus one. So that they be 513 or 1025, or uh, uh, they, they have to be a power of two plus one. So I import it and immediately I have terrain that is high where the texture is light white and low where the texture is black. Now, if you remember what that looked like, that particular raw, you'll notice that it's kind of mirrored here. It's mirrored in the vertical. And when it comes to importing uh, height maps that come from digital elevation models, which I've included a lot of here, uh, it's important to flip it in the vertical so there's a little option here to flip it in the vertical on the import. And now, it, now it's properly done. If you did this with one of the geographic uh, topographies that I'm providing, uh, it would turn out wrong. Um, so this immediately makes a terrain for you that can come from a digital elevation model. And I've provided a whole bunch of these for you that I've already generated, one of which is Antarctica. And this one I actually already flipped so you don't have to flip it. Uh, uh, it's flipped in the texture, but here's, here's Antarctica. And this is from a digital elevation model of Antarctica. It's actual uh, elevations and uh, we can now uh, walk around in Antarctica and uh, uh, see the different topography and terrains and uh, bumps and valleys and so forth. And this is all very cool. Um, some others that I've included, uh, a couple of the Grand Canyon. Uh, so here's from the Grand Canyon. Here's another Grand Canyon one. Uh, the Matterhorn, uh, Mount Katahdin, uh, Switzerland, the White Mountains. Um, and here's Acadia, 
for those of you who want to build a game in the park and remember to flip it otherwise it's not what a map of Bar Harbor looks like but here's Soames Fjord and Cadillac Mountain and I believe I have this set up so that when my character comes into the world uh, it's standing on top of Cadillac Mountain so we can look off and there's Long Pond and down here is Sand Beach and other kinds of features. Now, where those came from, um, um, uh, we need something, Photoshop, probably the real Photoshop will do it, but Photoshop Elements, which is what I have, doesn't. GIMP, which is a free photo editor, does export to RAW, and so you can use it. Uh, and so you, you need to make an image that has, uh, uh, that is a power of two plus one in both dimensions, and uh, set it up. Now, all these topographies I got from something called Terrain Party. And Terrain Party is, uh, 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 it has, whoops, it has uh, a, a map of the world and you can put this little square any place you want in the map of the world. And you can uh, download the topography in that little square which I believe you can change the size of here somehow, uh, make it, make the little square bigger uh, or make the little square smaller. And this is where I got the topographies for the Grand Canyon and Acadia and the White Mountains and all that stuff. It's from Terrain Party. Um, Terrain Party was designed for uh, another game um, it was designed for something called Skitty, City Skyline. And so the, they do have to be massaged a bit to get them into shape. You have to bring them in to GIMP or, or uh, uh, Photoshop if fo your Photoshop exports raw and uh, copy them into a 513 by 513 or 1025 by 1025 texture because they're not exactly the right size to bring directly into Unity. You do have to massage them a little bit. But anyway, it's all very cool. Um, uh, you need to bring, the, the, it downloads PNGs. You have to bring them into Photoshop and GIMP, copy them into a grayscale raw of appropriate dimensions and that you can then import into Unity. Um, the uh, generation of a height map terrain is one of the bonus problems on this week's assignment. And so it, if, you, uh, if you bother to make a terrain using one of the raw height maps that you get from Terrain Party and, and, uh, and fiddle with, or one of the ones that I provide in this height map file that I'll post. So again, I'll stop sharing and entertain any questions. So for that bonus, would we import the height map and then build a terrain off of it? Yeah. Like sculpt trees and stuff. It, it's a pretty easy bonus. You, 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 yeah, you, you bring in Antarctica or whatever, and then paint some, paint some texture on it and some, and I'm going to show you some other tools here in just a minute that make painting texture and doing other things, uh, really, really slick. Okay. There, okay. there are two potential bonuses for this assignment. One of them is to use uh, the terrain toolkit that I'm about to show you, uh, or the Unity uh, terrain tools, which are a similar high test version of terrain editor that, that you can use. Uh, but yeah, I'd like you to hand paint one yourself and, and then for a bonus, you can uh, create these other kinds. Okay, so they're pretty simple bonuses, but yeah. okay. So let me close this out here, close this one. So uh, just to show you, here's, uh, here's the Yosemite. 
and I've got a bunch of uh, AI cars that are driving around, racing over the topography. Uh, we'll talk about how to do these to these uh, AI cars later when we get to AIs. Um, but um, uh, uh, there, there are a whole bunch of different scenes here. Uh, here's uh, Katahdin uh, with a particularly nice little character. There's a flying character that comes from the Unity store. Uh, we can fly around in the world. These cars all race up Katahdin and uh, uh, over here's the knife edge. Some of you, I think, have probably climbed Katahdin, but there's the knife edge. Um, so um, there's a lot you can do with these terrains to make kind of interesting worlds. Let me show you one other. Whoops. Vlog. Um, here's the Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon. Pretty cool. So I'll let you play with these at your leisure. Quit that. It's taking a lot of cycles. Don't say. Okay. So the next tool I want to show you is the terrain toolkit. And there are two versions of this. This is this is a program. Uh, it originated back in 2009. This guy Sandor did it for some kind of uh, Unity demo. And he's continued to maintain the thing as we go along. The latest version of it is toolkit RE. Uh, uh, which is maybe a matrix reference to resurrect it. I don't know, uh, but it works in Unity 2020. Uh, the uh, U Terrain Toolkit 2017, which was an update of the 2009 version, uh, does work in, in uh, Unity 217 to 219, but the RE one only works in 2020. And these are both on the asset store. I've provided links here. Um, the, uh, th this, as I mentioned, is one of the optional bonuses to use the toolkit to generate a decorated terrain. And uh, it comes with a manual. And I'm not going to go through the full manual here because basically I cut and pasted the manual into uh, uh, this document. But uh, it, it has a lot of tools for building terrain. So I've started off here with my terrain that I set to be 200 by 200 by 50. It's uh, the default terrain settings tend to be kind of high. It's 1,000 by 1,000 by 600. So you end up with these terrains that are unreasonably tall. Uh, I find about a 10 to one or five to one ratio for height to width makes for a more realistic looking terrain. So once you've downloaded uh, the toolkit, it's in this uh, folder com, and there's a script, one script that we have to add to our terrain. So I just basically dragged this over and put it in the terrain and this is the terrain toolkit. I believe here I'm using the uh, 217 version. I'm in a I'm in a uh, 219.4. That's my dog making noise here for anyone who wondered about that. So um, right off the bat, the toolkit has a number of tools for making terrain. And I discuss these various tools here in the in the, the document. Uh, Veroni, for instance, makes uh, a height map that uh, makes a bunch of mountain-like peaks, and it does it using this uh, uh, Veroni diagram that uh, makes these different polygons around these randomly scattered points, and 
understanding what it's doing is not necessary. We press the create button, we press the Veroni button. There are a number of different presets, scattered peaks uh, or rolling hills or jagged mountains, all of which adjust the number of cells, the features, the scale, and some other things. Um, and I'll do rolling hills here, and I'll press the generate, and it makes a terrain. Now, these Veronis don't look very realistic. Um, we have two other styles. One is fractal, uh, and this generates a fractal terrain. And it looks kind of nice and bumpy. <clears throat> and we have Perlin, which is a different way of generating random terrains. And it makes uh, a bumpy terrain too. And each of these have different preset settings that uh, will make different style of things. But one of the things that you can do here to make it more interesting is generate Veroni, and then go to Fractal, uh, pick one of the presets, uh, Rough Mountains, and now turn the blend down. The blend at one will completely replace what's there. But if I have the blend set down to about 0.5 or so, it will instead blend it with the Veroni generated bumps there. And so I have the kind of high bumps of the Veroni with the fractal laid on top of it. And uh, right away, I've got kind of a realistic looking terrain here that has these various bumps on it and uh, uh, high mountains and different features. So you can, you can, uh, and you can do the same thing with the Perlin. You can uh, uh, add it to this scene. And so it, it generates topographies that look kind of nice and realistic. Uh, there's also a smooth tool. If I press this, it'll smooth out any jagged bumps. I'll press it once and it smoothed it a little bit. And so these tools kind of generate your basic terrain. The fractal, uh, it uses uh, 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 a plasma fractal algorithm. And Perlin uh, uh, does this by uh, uh, using successive octaves of noise that get smaller and smaller as you go to higher and higher octaves. Um, the smoothing tool normalize is a, is a good one. Uh, with the normalized tool, uh, you can kind of set your terrain to have a minimum height, which is all the way at the bottom zero of my terrain, or a maximum height of one, which is all the way at the top of my terrain, 50. And so this will kind of scale the terrain back up so that it goes from zero to 50. The lowest point is at zero, and the highest point is at 50. Uh, now, another really cool feature of this is the erosion tool. Uh, uh, there are a number of different physics-based models of erosion. And I'll just run quickly through these. There's uh, uh, fast, harsh erosion here. I, I just do this. And thermal erosion tends to take stuff where it's steep and move it down to areas where it's flat. Uh, hydraulic is kind of the opposite of that. It takes stuff that's where it's flat and moves it down onto cliffs. And I'll just show you the uh, velocity version of this with heavy rainfall and soft earth. Uh, and this is doing kind of subtle things to our topography using these physics-based models and uh, uh, a lot of these details are not visible until you get down on the world, but uh, 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 these erosional features uh, have done some subtle things to the terrain uh, that uh, make it look kind of realistic. Um, and there's a title which, uh, you kind of set the height of your 
your waves. Uh, you, you can set the height of your waves here to like 25 and the amplitude of your waves. And uh, this will uh, make tidal erosion. It makes kind of cliffs and it flattens out areas underneath the water. Wind uh, lets you blow wind across the landscape and it kind of picks up dust, carries it and drops it. And there are all kinds of different settings here. Uh, the presets are basically directions. So I'll let you play with them. Uh, quickly, I want to talk about the texturing tool because I'm almost out of time here and I wanted to finish this today. Uh, the texturing tool, I'm going to add a bunch of textures here. I'm just going to fill up my texture list with as many as I can get. And my dog is rattling around in the background here, playing with his toy or toys. So, um, the default texture comes up with these checkerboards. And I'm going to add a texture here. There's a red somewhere in my inventory. And there's a green somewhere in my inventory. I spelled green correctly. And a blue. blue. Sorry. These are textures that uh, that come with the toolkit. And I just do these because it makes it really easy to see what this texturing tool is going to do. So I've loaded this up and I'll apply the textures. And right away, you can see that it has laid these textures out based on elevation. And these are kind of the default settings that it comes up with as you add them. But I'm going to change these. Uh, I want that to be 0 0.3 and 0 0.3, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.7, and 0.7. Now, these are the start and end of each of the textures. And I've made texture one end at a height of 0.1. So this is zero to one out of my 50. Uh, and texture two starts at 0.1. And texture two ends at 0.3 and so forth. And so now, whoops, I don't want to run the game. Now, when I do the procedural, we get sharp bands. And because they begin and end at, at the same place. If I set this to point two, so now texture one ends at point one, texture two doesn't start until point two. And so what it's gonna do is it's gonna blend texture one to texture two through that range from point one to point two. And so this gives us kind of, whoops. 0.6, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4, 0. 0.5, 0. 0.6, 0. 0.7, and 0. 0.8. So now I'm now my beginning and ends don't match up. And so this is going to generate uh, uh, kind of blended textures. You can see in between. Here, it's blending between blue and green and blue and cyan. Now, the other, the first texture here, which I haven't, I don't see any evidence of, is the cliff texture. And the cliff texture uh, starts at a slope of 60 degrees, and it becomes completely te cliff texture at a slope of 75. Now, I don't seem to have any slopes that steep in my little world here. So if I set this to 20 and this to 30, this should generate some cliff texture. Yeah, and so here we're now seeing cliff texture along this. Now, of course, we're not gonna, we're not gonna use these, but in the toolbox, there's a cliff. Uh, 
which cliff do I want? I like this one. And so right away, you see the cliff texture appears in here. And uh, for here, I'll pick a sand, beach sand. And for this one, I'll pick a grass. Uh, and for this one, I'll do another grass. Sorry, class is definitely over. You can go if you need to. And rock. And of course, for the top, snow. And so now my, ter my terrain is all nicely colored with uh, a cliff texture where it's very steep and grasses and snow on the top of mountains and sand down in the lowlands. And so this is all a very cool tool uh, for generating terrain. So I'll stop sharing and take any questions. I know a lot of you have to leave, but let's see. Can you any? apply textures uh like to specific areas or do you have to do it by height the toolbox uh the, the toolkit does it by height but you can then go in and paint them by hand yourself right all right okay so you can paint terrain by hand but anytime you press that procedural button it replaces everything by height so it and you know in the real world the texture of terrain often has a lot to do with elevation. You know, we've got low uh, beaches down at sea level and we have grass and meadows and, and more rocky and snow at the top. So it, it's a quick way to make uh, topography. And I did use this in the, uh, in those Grand Canyon uh, uh, Acadia, uh, pictures that I showed with the cars driving around. That's how I colored all of them. Any other questions? It's a cool tool. And that's an optional bonus. You don't have to do it, but I recommend it. I just, I have a quick question. Um, have you heard any previous complaints any what? Any complaints uh, in previous classes about like Linux support for Unity? Um, I know there is a, a Linux version of Unity. Um, I have people, it, it, it was kind of a, an independently maintained thing for a while. Some woman ran it. Uh, but I, last, I, last I read, there was an official version. Uh, I, I think one of the links takes you to the Linux site or uh, why are yeah, you I was, in trouble with I, it? I, I'm struggling a little. I think the I think it's not really well supported. Um, so I'm just running it in Windows now. But sorry, about I didn't that. think it was something on my end. I think it's just you know the Windows version is pretty good. Uh, I think it's actually better than the Mac version in some ways. Uh, the, my Mac struggles with some features of Unity, particularly I, I, I can barely run 2021. Thank you. Uh, and the high, the high def render pipeline, I, I can hardly use it. Uh, any other questions? Feel free to stay and chat among yourselves if you want to.